learned about him because he studied with Dr. Charles Malone uh, in New York, who is known for hand surgery. Uh, he's, he's spoken at national conference a few times. And when I called his office, uh, he's kind of hard to get an appointment with that I didn't have the right insurance and whatnot. So I said, well, who studied with him or under him? And they said, well, there's a gentleman in Houston. I said, well, I live in Dallas. That's close. And so uh, I said, well, what's his name? Well, Dr. Corsandi. Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah, he also has another satellite office in Bedford. I said, well, I live in Dallas. That's even closer. So um, he's a wonderful doctor. Uh, I know that Dr. Uh, Asasi and Dr. Mays also highly recommend him. So for all of those of us that have hand involvement or don't yet but have scleroderma, you're going to want to listen to this. So uh, thank you, Dr. Prasadi, for coming. Thank you for introduction. It's a privilege to be here today, and like Dr. Sassi, I want to be uh, very informal, so if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. We'll take some questions at the end as well. Uh, I love what I do. You know, I never thought that I'd be a hand surgeon in, in Texas you know, but, uh, along the way uh, through my training, and I, when I picked a hand fellowship I picked the best, and Dr. Miller is one of the best hand surgeons in the country. Uh, and um, like myself, he has a philosophy of taking on more of the challenging uh, cases and, and doing things that no one else wants to take care of, and, and challenging disease processes that no one else wants to deal with. And to that, I'm very grateful because that's how I practice today. And I, and I'm very grateful to be down here in Houston. So um, with that in mind, uh, let's begin. Some of the first slides, uh, we'll just skip over a little bit, just because Dr. Sassi covered them so well, I don't need to reiterate what you already said. One of the best lines I ever remember was uh, uh, Cy Sims used to say, an educated consumer is our best customer. So a lot of what I like to do is educate everyone in this room. Because the more you learn, and due to the advancements in, in information technology and Googling, uh, patients have become very educated. And uh, you can empower yourself by learning what's out there. And, um, and that's good. Because when someone comes to my office, I want them to know everything. I want them to have done research. And I want them to ask good questions. I think that's very important. Because as everyone knows, physicians are infallible and, and you know they don't always have all the answers and someone in this room may be may know more about scleroderma than myself and, and that's okay so it's important to get as much information uh, learn about the disease process and, and, and empower yourselves to get the best care out there um, the only thing I want to say about this slide is Hopefully there'll be a few more bullet points in the future when we uh, talk about the years they were secured and <coughs> um, we don't have to deal with uh, this problem. If you could take a little out Sure, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so these are the slides I'm going to skip over. The only thing on this slide is uh, incidents and prevalence. Incidents is our new patients uh, and prevalence are existing. Uh, we always want to see the prevalence go up because that means people, patients will be living longer. Um, we know that females are affected three to one. And so I'm going to skip a few of these slides and get more to the hand stuff. <clears throat> so when we talk, when I evaluate a patient for a hand problems related to scleroderma, there's a lot of factors that go into considering uh, what a patient may need done or not done for them. Uh, skin, we talk about soft tissue, bones, arteries, veins, nerves, and joints. Um, soft tissue really just means everything, you know, in the, in the fat, the subcutaneous area. Bones, you, everyone knows what those are. Uh, arteries and veins, there's, as we get down through the extremity, the arteries and veins get smaller and smaller and smaller. And um, 
when we do surgery, we actually have to use a microscope for that small. Uh, nerves, uh, there's several major nerves, and then they again branch off into small, small digital nerves, etc. Joints are the spaces between bones. I just put this x ray up um, just to show you the relationship between bones. And by the way, I apologize to Dr. Stasi and found the pointer. <laughs> <laughs> so these are your joints and these are your bones. You could, we have 28 bones in the hand. The, the wrist bones are all many different shapes. You have these long bones and then these have proximal, middle, and distal phalanxes and the joints between them are... These are known as your proximal interphalangeal joints, and these are known as your distal interphalangeal joints. What am I doing? What am I doing wrong? Maybe that. Do that? Okay. Is it better? I think it's better. I think it's something with the speaker. Maybe good. Okay. Um, just briefly, you can take a look at how intricate the arterial system is in your head. There's actually, this is your radial artery, ulnar artery, and there's one arch here, and then there's another arch behind it, and then they branch off to common digital arteries, and those common branch off into digital arteries. And there's always a dominant artery and a non-dominant artery in each finger, and usually it's the one closest to the middle finger is the dominant artery of that finger. So you can see how small they get to the tip where they're almost okay to see them. So this comes into play, it's very important because when you're dealing with ulcers and, and fingers are at risk for ischemia, which is lack of blood supply, this is why these, blood, these little tiny vessels get smaller and smaller. Okay, so I, I put up a few terms just real quick. Terminology is very important. Scleroderma, obviously hard skin. Calcin calcinosis just means calcium deposits inside the skin. Gangrene, uh, basically dead tissue. Arthrodesis, this is a pr something that we perform. Just basically means taking two bones where the joint was and making them into one or fusing them <laughs> together. Arthroplasty is another term that hand surgeons love to use but that basically means replacing your joint with an artificial one. Sympathectomies is another common term that you may hear in, in hand uh, problems and basically means separating the sympathetic nerve from the adjacent artery. So along each artery that you saw in the fingers, there's usually a nerve running along it. Ulcers, they're just erosions of skin due to multiple factors such as pressure, from bones or poor, poor blood supply. Raynaud's disease and Raynaud's phenomenon. It's two different entities. The disease, just there's no specific underlying medical problem that's causing it, but in the phenomenon, there's an underlying medical problem such as scleroderma that's causing it. Skipping ahead. Okay, so uh, a couple of things before you see me. Uh, you know, sometimes you may want to do some local wound care, uh, medication, biofeedback, a lot of these things. You're usually dealt with by your primary medical doctor. Um, so some, some basic things about wound care that I just want to touch upon. Uh, keep the wounds as clean and dry as possible. I recommend cleaning your wounds daily or twice daily. Uh, try to take off pressure off of any ulcerated areas. So splinting can sometimes help. Uh, try to debride or remove dead tissue. Uh, and if you're gonna do it, try to use sterile instruments, Q-tips. Be gentle around wounds. Uh, you can cover the wounds to protect. And there's so many different you know, things available. Uh, zero form is bacteriostatic, which means it's got uh, something impregnated in it that can help kill some of the bacteria. Then there's not you know, adaptive and other things that 
may not stick, you know, when you put it on, it won't stick. So when you take off a, you know, gauze or anything, it's not actually sticking to the wound. It comes off easy. And I get a lot of questions like, mm -hmm. well, what's the best solution to use? Uh, sterile water, hydrogen peroxide, which ointments to use? Uh, polysporin, neosporin, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <laughs> and there's a few things I live by when I tell patients to deal with their, their wounds. Uh, one, one, my favorite one is the solution to the pollution is dilution. The best way to deal with any, any else that may, may or may not be affected is to wash it out. Because, you know, the more you dilute bacteria, the, the better chance it is of dying because you're weakening its concentration. So uh, that's very easy to do. Um, when it comes down to putting antibiotic ointments on um, infected wounds, I'm not a big fan of it because you know, you know yeah, the, there is some of the anti uh, you know, bacterial factor, but the what I feel is if it's an infected wound, it, you shouldn't be occluding it or putting something warm and put it in a warm, dark environment, a moist environment. I think that helps sometimes make the, the bacteria survive. So these are just little things. So I like dry dressings. I like changing them frequently. I like it, irrigating them. Uh, if you go to use any, they found that if you look at the, I had found this chart, polysporin or neosporin, probably is the most effective. Some of these other ones are less effective. And believe it, in the middle here, if you didn't do anything, 13 days to healing, and these are like, if you use polysporin, you can cut it down a little bit. So there, there's a wide variety of Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought you said you don't mind people using neosporin. I, I don't. I'm not a big fan of it for infected wounds, but if you're doing it more for prophylactic stuff, you, you have a wound that's not really looking too infected, I, I'm okay with it. Okay. If it's infected, I'm, I, I like just cleaning it out and doing local wound care. Um, you know, you could do it if, they, if your doctor recommends it. With, you know, it, and it's six of one and a half a dozen another. Uh, my my thing is is what you know get the wound to heal. You know, try to do the best you can. And when you say cleaning it out, what do you recommend cleaning it out with? Just you, water? Usually, I, I just tell patients use sterile saline. If, like sterile saline. You know, you can mix it with a little bit of hydrogen peroxide, but everything has a pro and con to it. You know, uh, if you use iodine, it's a little caustic to the wounds. If you uh, same thing with hydrogen peroxide. Remember, the skin is very delicate mm -hmm. and, and, and could you know, be damaged around the edges. So you've got to be very careful. I mean, people do it. I'm, I just think so. Uh, just regular sterile saline to me has worked the best. Yes? When I use on my ulcers, and I have them tested by body, it, really, it dries them out, and uh, they heal really fast. Is Johnson's and Johnson's had the antibacterial paint to be washed and a septic wash. So I'll dilute that in a bowl of warm water and soak my fingers in there. And it causes the pus to uh, ooze out. And by overnight, they will dry. So that's what I use to, to soak them in. Just, I don't use it, like you say, the misborn in the nose. And that really, really helps. The problem is, they would occur. But as far as just like your top of the general measures, that looks great for me. Walgreens and the CVS have this uh, generica, what she's talking about. Did you go with that? You know, I think of some of it's trial and error. I think sometimes if you, you you need to try one and see if it works for you. And if it doesn't, try something else. There's, there's really no major guidelines for it. Just over the years, I'm just telling you from my experience, but you all have more experience than I <laughs> of what works or what doesn't. And if anyone else has, has any other uh, things that work for them, uh, please share with the rest of your colleagues. You know, it's important. And you know, one of these, one of the big things is we don't do studies on these things to say, well, what's superior to the other? Mm -hmm. It's hard to do a randomized study on what's the best agent to use yeah. and, and some of them out there are very expensive and maybe overkill especially some of the things that you can apply and, and it's far beware 
Okay, so I have a few simple rules to live by. Uh, just, you know, always be aware of your environment. Mittens are warm, uh, are warmer than gloves. Hand warmers, uh, avoid rapid changes in temperature. Always be prepared. Uh, your purse or your satchel is your best friend. Live in warmer climate, I'll have to tell you that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're in a cold weather, you have feet, the car, feed steering wheel, although well, no, Dallas gets cold. Um, uh, stay calm, uh, keep your body warm. Uh, try not to hold cold drinks for too long. Be careful with cold water in the house, such as your washing machine, your shower, and the refrigerator. And um, you know, wear warm clothes. You have the alpaca there. It's 100% hypoallergenic. <laughs> uh, there's a lot. Of, I'm not going to really go into detail about medications. Yes. Sorry, I had a question because I have Dr. Sasson. He was more fancy. So <laughs> 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 I'm not like doing a part. No. So um, I'm not so much able to now. But before, when I was able to, um, like working out. <laughs> I'd be fine during the workout, and then about 10 minutes afterwards, I have a severe Raynaud's attack. And I don't know why. That's just a change in internal body temperature, like blood going to the heart versus hands, or I'm, is well, there? Yeah, and uh, I think a lot, when you are more active, your body just knows to, uh, you know, take, bring blood to more of the vital organs, such as your heart, your lungs. So your extremities are, you know, at our terminal places. So less blood's going to go there, more blood's going to be diverted to those vital organs. And I think that's probably the most likely scenario for you. It, it also could be, you know, uh, the way you, I mean, if you're jogging, your arms are elevated, um, things like that. So um, I think that's pretty much what's going on. Low impact, you should, you know, try to do low impact, take frequent breaks, things like that. I think that'll help you out. She doesn't like to hear that. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of medications out there that you should try. A lot of them are directed more towards, uh, you know, increasing blood flow to the extremities, um, you know, a lot of them are off-label usage, so which basically means there's really no real indication to use that drug for that, but we use it anyway because we know that there is some benefit. Um, you know, and uh, there's some people. You know, Viagra is a, always the everyone <laughs> loves talking about Viagra. Uh, and, you know, it does increase some blood flow. You know. uh, my favorite drug right now is Botox, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, you know, biofeedback, I, I don't do any of it, and it's basically trying to train your brain to control your, your peripheral nervous system or your extremities, and there's a lot of literature about it. I've never had anyone really say that they've had a lot of success with it, but it's out there. Okay, so, I know Dr. Sassi talked a little bit about these. Uh, so some of the hand manifestations that we really see uh, are Raynaud's phenomena, digital tip or PIP ischemia. So that, that's those threats over here. Um, infections and ulcers, sterodactyly, uh, calcinosis, and resorption of the distal phalanx. R what resorption really means is um, the bone just starts to kind of fade away at the tips. Starts to what? Fade away, you know, you start to lose bone. See how the, the tips? So right that's here? why some of your fingers are shorter right. than others. Now, what happens when some fingers seem to get longer? Or is that just because the others are shorter? I think it's because the others are shorter. <laughs> I'm not growing new bone, no. right? Well, okay. That, yes or no, you know, we regenerate bone all the time. You know, your bone, your body is constantly resorbing and forming new bone, constantly. Healthy or not healthy. In the so we're, we're constantly doing that. But the rate of resorption is greater 
than formation, so then you end up losing some of it. What is it about the cuticles that I've had like just random doctors that see me for the first time be able to look at my cuticles and say, oh yeah, that's typical of sternum? It's more like a, a clubbing effect where the cuticles are more rounded, I think. Oh, maybe. So that's probably what I think they're looking at. What in your mind is this C A uh, calcinosis? And then is that those little hard spots that I are have a beautiful picture of it coming what? up. I have a great picture of it coming up. Oh. I'll show it to you. Just give me one second. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of diagnostic testing, like the biopsy for the lung fibrosis, um, we can get these tests, but it doesn't often change what we're gonna do. Um, the MRA is a good test that's or you know that's basically do an MRI with injecting dye. Um, a little bit more invasive, we don't do as much as we used to because the MRIs are so good and the MRAs is actually sticking a catheter in your artery and injecting dye, that's called an angiogram or arteriogram. CT scans, I don't really do that many, but it's an option. Bone scans can tell you active bone being resorbed or not resorbed, can also help you decide whether or not the bone that's got an ulcer near it is infected because you know these ulcers can lead to osteomyelitis. <coughs> so sometimes we have to be very vigilant about that as well. Um, and and if there, you know, I'll order a bone scan for that reason. And if you do have osteomyelitis, but you're looking at like six weeks of antibiotics, usually they'll put a pick line in and, and do it from home. But those are reasons why we would get a bone scan. Plasmography, um, that just basically measures blood flow, temperature, and things like that. Could tell you if blood's flowing to the fingertips. Same thing with Doppler, is it's basically an ultrasound uh, pass where you can hear the sound and you can actually see an image. Is there a good flow to those digits? But ultimately, physical exam is really the best way of, you know, the best test for anything. You know, I can tell. And any good fellowship trained hand surgeon should be able to make most diagnoses just with the physical exam. And x rays are, you know, the basic x rays are really easy to do and tell a lot. Yes? You know, I know that we're losing the little uh, <coughs> blood vessels in, in our fingers, but are, the, are all our blood vessels becoming smaller? Because I know it's getting harder and harder to get any needle in any of my veins now than it used to be. It could be a combination of the, the fact that you progressively get sclerodactyly, you know, the, you know, the skin's getting really hard, and it's probably hard to find those veins in, in the subcutaneous tissue, you know, just underneath the skin. Um, I think that contributes to it, but also, when we do the digital sympathectomies, what we're doing is we're actually peeling away the outer layer of the artery you know, what's, and there's, t there's actually hard tissue that's like fibrotic around it. So I, you know, some of the larger vessels probably exhibit some of that, but at least they're, the lumen or the size of them are large enough that there's still good blood flow going through it. So, you know, I think that's, you know, it's two, two different issues going on. Does that answer your question? Well, like I have plasma taking, uh, out, I have, um, they make plasma chairs for me, and it, it seems like it's harder and harder for, it, for them, you know, to keep the, the, the vein open that long mm -hmm. for, for it to go the whole cycle so that they have to take it out because it, it seems to try to collapse on them near the end mm -hmm. before we get the whole bag full anymore. So, so you're to able to get, they're able to get the vein, it's just that it's, it's collapsing. Well, yeah, it's harder to get it to start with, but yeah, then it collapses near the end before they finish it. Mm -hmm. And it didn't used to be that way, it would still the whole time. So I was just... I'm not sure, other than also, you know, if you get stuck in the same vein over and over again, or the same, you know, you're going to get some sclerosis of the veins just by trauma. Okay. So I'm not really sure. You know, that, that's the first time I heard something. So if you can get a vein, then you know I don't think it's you know it's uh, any 
like they would do with sclerosis around it, it's kind of other than, um, you know, from trauma, from the repeated sticks, you know? I was just curious. So this is a good picture, uh, just an example of an angiogram. And, and you can see a good flow of blood going through here. But look at the ones, look at some of these other ones. And there's almost like a cutoff here, right? It should look like that, going right to the tips. But you can see where there's compromise. So this is where sometimes these tests can be helpful. Which test is that? That's an MRA, <laughs> mag magnetic residency yeah. angina. <laughs> so, you know, like we talked about, it's good for teaching medical <laughs> students, but it's also good for talking about the process. I don't think we, I ever say to patients, you have Crest syndrome, but it's good to just talk about it in this order so we don't forget things. It's good to remember. Call them mnemonics. So calcinosis, Raynaud's, we won't talk about that. It's third actor, you tell Angiotasia. So here's the picture that I want to show you. This is good for the calcinosis. You can see the big calcium deposit right here under the distal phalanx. And also over here too. And which way did you get this picture? Just do an x-ray? Yes, is that this, this is an x-ray. X-ray. Yeah. And what happens is the calcium deposits are just building up here in this what we call the subcutaneous tissue just underneath the skin over here. And calcium deposits can happen other places than just the hand, right? That's correct. I have another picture for that one. <laughs> 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 you got a good question. So, <laughs> that was a long time. Here's another <laughs> nice uh, picture. We call it we call the very end of the finger the top. It's got that funny looking, almost like mushroom appearance. And here's one right at the top. Okay. So it's amazing to me that the people uh, went to a hand specialist, supposedly taught, but hadn't obviously dealt with scleroderma. He didn't know what it was. I ended up going to a wound specialist in mm -hmm. Memorial Hermann Hospital's top wound doctor. He said, I won't do surgery on me, but he couldn't tell me. Finally, after eight years, one of us came to the surface and I was able to squeeze it, and I took that. So Dr. May and her assistant looked under a microscope and said it's calcium. Right. So I went through eight years of pain in one little spot. Now they're showing up all over. Wow. And you know, it's funny. I, I call these uh, you know, calcium deposits icebergs because look at this picture here, right? You can't even tell. There's nothing there, you know? No. But it's there. It's underneath it, you know? So. What, what's above the surface is not always knowing what's below the surface. And that goes back to kind of what we were talking about the last lecture. But wh why do you have so, you know, why do your fingers get so hard after the medical, you know, the, the infusions? Because there's all these other things going on that you don't see, you know, you only see the skin, but there's everything else going on. So Dr. Corsani, is there anything to do, you may be talking about it in another slide, to reduce the calcinosis? Is there anything we're doing to promote it? I wish we had an answer to that. There's no, as far as I know, there's no medication to take to reduce the calcium deposits. And the crazy thing is, is there's no rhyme or reason where they end up. Uh -huh. You know, sometimes it's one finger on the patient. And it's the same finger over and over again. You take, it, you take the calcinosis out, and it's not like it goes to another finger, it goes right back to that one finger. And these are things that, you know, hopefully in the future we'll be able to answer why it happens. But right now nobody knows. Would you discourage us from picking at it to dig it out? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> so I'll get to that okay. in a second. <laughs> so do so what is it just uh, or do other people get these? Calcium, calcium buildup. Because I am amazed how many doctors I went to <coughs> and didn't know what I had until that I squeezed one out, which was very painful to do. It's now I'm getting used to it. I'm squeezing that out. There are other disease processes that have similar things to it. Like we, there's some patients that have these big rheumatoid nodules that form. Gout can form big nodules. 
So yes, I mean, there's different types that are similar. Well, what so. causes a calcium yeah, deposit? Do I think it's, it's, uh, it's pro I'm not really 100% certain. I think it's probably an increase in the metabolism, your m metabolic state, where you having more, and, and that's the thing, nobody knows, nobody really knows. You know, if there was a way to control it, we would, you know, we'd be giving you some kind of medicine. If you, it was just hypercalcemia or something, we'd be controlling your endocrine system, but nobody really knows for sure. But you can get them anywhere, because I have one in my breast right now. Yeah, and, and here's a good, you know, I only put a couple of extremity pictures, but here's a big, well, uh, one, see, again, doesn't look that big on the surface. And look at how much calcium deposit there is around the elbow. So. Question. Sure. I actually have one on my elbow, and it just feels like a dry, hard piece of skin that maybe if you click at it, it will go away. But how do you help ease the pain from bending? Because well, it's right on that joint. Well, that's the thing, um, and that's the next thing I'm going to talk about. When do we consider surgery, and when do we just leave them alone? So that's the slide here. Um, I knew there was a slide for that. <laughs> <laughs> to build up the excitement. And, uh, so anyway, you know, considerations. When, when do we take out count? Do we take it out all the time? No. Um, the size of it is definitely a consideration. Uh, when you have breaks in the skin or leakage, um, there's always the risk for infection, or just, you know, it's annoying, <coughs> it's unsightly, it's bothersome. Those are times we consider taking it out. And then location. Uh, you know, if it's on a pressure point, uh, is it inhibiting function, such as yours, where it's near a joint? Uh, is it overlying a nerve? Those are times where we think, well, we should take these out. Uh, is it, you know, is it right on the thumb where you have to pinch? and it hurts every time you do it. Um, they're also, they contribute to a lot of the ulcers because it's additional pressure in that area, and so whenever you have pressure over time, the skin breaks down. So these are all reasons to consider surgery. Um, short of that, uh, there is, some will resolve a little bit, but I don't think they ever resolve 100% on their own, you know? Did I answer your question? Or? Okay. The Texas leg. This is the Raynaud. We're going to switch and talk a little bit about Raynaud. And um, so, like you were saying, white, then blue, then red. And this is a good picture. If no one's ever seen, you can see clearly the Peterson has have some white uh, changes to the fingers. And that's just because the blood vessels at this point are completely in, in spasm, okay? There's no blood flow to that area. So if you fail medical management, medications aren't helping, you've done all the conservative things, there's something that I do as a surgeon called the digital sympathectomy uh, that can help with this problem. Uh, and Early on, you know, a lot of the studies have been disappointing. And basically, uh, over the years, in, different doctors have published different papers on how to do one of these sympathectomies. So a lot of the next few slides just talks about different ones, so I'm gonna kind of skip through them and give you the, the cliff notes of this, okay? So there's some studies, and you know, we always like to see literature proving that it works. So this, this one particular study did uh, 10 patients, 18 digits, and they noted uh, immediate relief, ulcers healed uh, within two weeks. Here's another uh, you know, uh, study, three patients, 11 digits. So you can see the numbers are low on these studies. They're not like 1,000 patients. So you gotta take these with a grain of salt, but they do help. And um, there's different ways to do a sympathectomy, so I'm just going to briefly tell you. And a couple of slides coming up, just to warn you, are actual hands that are in the OR, so if anyone wants to turn away, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, so basically a sympathectomy is 
separating the little tiny artery from the, from the vein and stripping the, 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 the outside layer of, of the artery. So it, and the purpose of it is to increase blood flow. 